Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Myrtle Inlet Community Center and the first Community Creek Talk in 32 years. <laughs> Were any of y'all at the uh, inaugural Creek Talks back in the uh, first week of April 1992? I was. <laughs> Rick was. Um, back in 32 years ago, everybody still read the community newspapers. Nobody streamed anything to their TV set. Nobody had a smartphone. And everybody had an attention span. <laughs> well, we were preparing to do the first spring tide, and we're preparing to do the 31st spring tide this coming Sunday. If you're not familiar with that, I would uh, ask you to pick up a flyer because it's a huge community cleanup and celebration of Merle's Inlet. Uh, it's a big day. We call it a day for the inland, and it is, beginning with an opening ceremony in which we do a number of things, including uh, say goodbye to our departed over the last year. Um, and then it proceeds to a couple of hours of cleaning up the marsh and the community. And if we have enough people, it only takes a couple of hours to make a huge difference. After Hurricane Ian, there's going to be quite a bit of lumber and floats and whatnot to pick up. So that happens Sunday. Now, 32 years ago, we had three community creek talks three nights in a row before spring tide. But like I said, everybody had an attention span and nothing else to do. <laughs> and at that time, I believe, if I'm not wrong, Dr. Dennis Allen, who was the director of the Baruch Marine Lab down at Hobka, I believe, was one of our speakers. And that was a younger version of Dr. Dennis Allen. And a younger version of I, of me, introduced him. <laughs> Dennis, is, Dennis and uh, his wife Wendy are going to be doing the first presentation. Now I wanted to just say, and not take up any amount of time here, but spring tide is a wonderful thing, but it's a superficial thing. It affects the appearance of the marsh. If we hadn't been doing that for 31 years, it's, it's almost impossible to imagine what that marsh would look like. The first year we got between 70 and 140 tons in one day. And it's gone on for years and years and made a huge difference. But it's skin deep, it's appearance. And today we're gonna to have experts in the deeper, more important issues that affect the creek, Merle's Inlet. This is not a political meeting, it's not about the differences that we may have among each other. This is about learning and learning only, and it's about learning about the salt marsh, which is the reason we came here, which is the reason we stayed here if we were born here, and it is, in fact, the creek, which is the glue that holds us all together as a community. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dennis Allen. And Wendy Allen. So actually, I'm going to do the talk. <laughs> There's Wendy. Now, I just want to read uh, Dennis's bio because those of you who don't know him should. He was the director of the Brute Marine Field Laboratory of the University of South Carolina for 40 years, retiring as a distinguished research professor in, 19, or in 2018. He oversaw the development of research and academic education programs and the facilities on Hobcaw Barony by Georgetown and his first job after completing his PhD at Lehigh University where he did his research in the salt marshes of southern New Jersey. One of the first things he had to face when he came to Baruch was the recovery of the program and rebuilding it after Hurricane Hugo destroyed the entire facility in 1989. So they had a spring tide of their own. In the early 1990s, Dr. Allen helped to get the North Inlet, Win North Inlet Winya Bay National Estuarine, that's a tough one, um, <laughs> research reserve started. He served as the president of the International Organization of Coastal and Estuarine Scientists, the Estuarine <laughs> Research Foundation from 2001 to 2003. Dennis's primary research interest had been in the early life stages of fishes, shrimps, and crabs, 
and how they use salt marshes and creeks. He still studies these matters, continues to work on the microscope, and publish papers based on long-term studies of zooplankton in North Inlet Estuary. Wendy served as the manager of the North Inlet Winya Bay National, say it with me, Estuarine <laughs> Research Reserve from 2001 until her retirement in 2018. She was the education coordinator for the reserve and the director of continuing education for the Bell W. Baruch Institute for Marine and Coastal Sciences of the University of South Carolina. Wendy received a Bachelor of <laughs> Stuck Papers in <laughs> Biology. <laughs> Bachelor of Science degree in Biology from Lehigh University in 1975, Master of Education from the University of South Carolina in 1980. Enamored by salt marshes since they were youngsters, and evidently enamored of each other since they were college students, Dennis and Wendy have lived on the South Carolina coast for 45 years. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Dennis Allen. <laughs> Thanks, Chip. We can't say enough uh, by way of thanks to Chip for all he's done to increase the awareness and the well-being of Merle Zalit and much of the coast of South Carolina. Yeah. Thank you, Chip. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for your interest in learning more about uh, salt marshes and, and estuaries, uh, condensing what I'd like to tell you about these systems and into less than 20 minutes is, is quite a challenge, but I'll try my best. Uh, hopefully you'll leave with some, some new appreciation and, and perspectives on, on just how these systems uh, originated, uh, how they work, uh, and where they appear to be going. Wendy is the professional... The more? Wendy's the professional educator and communicator in the family, um, but given the amount of allotted time, we thought it, it would be best if uh, just one of us made the presentation, uh, trying to keep it on track and maybe, hopefully, a little easier for you to follow. A busy diagram, but I'll step you through it. Uh, let's start for how we got to where we are today. Uh, this is a cross section of the eastern part of South Carolina, extending from about 90 miles inland to the edge of the continental shelf. It shows how changing sea level has moved the coastline, the shoreline, uh, over the eons. Sea level's changed a lot, uh, probably on the order of a thousand feet over the ages, uh, as huge amounts of the Earth's water was tied up in glaciers, thawed, uh, froze again, uh, and this has been repeated dozens of times over Earth's history. The yellow arrow on the right shows the location of our coast today. To the right of that, the blue arrow shows where it was about 100 million years ago. Uh, that's about 200 feet higher than we're sitting here today. Uh, and then the blue arrow on the uh, left shows where it was about 18,000 years ago. Uh, and that point at the edge of the continental shelf is under about 400 feet of water now, uh, and it's about 50 miles offshore. Uh, and we can still find remnants of ancient submerged forests and the bones of extinct mammals all across the continental shelf. Let's see if this works. Okay. Uh, the rate of sea level rise uh, has slowed a bit, uh, at least in the late last uh, 8,000 years. And, and uh, about 3,000 years ago, and this is from cores taken through the Merrill's Inlet Marsh, sea level is about three feet lower, uh, which puts the barrier islands and the marshes a mile or two or three off our shore. Um, sometime during that period, Native Americans uh, inhabited this immediate area, uh, and, and of course generations had to move westward as the uh, marshes did themselves. Uh, we can actually see, you know, the shell mounds that they built 500 to 1500 
years ago uh, perched above the current Mars surface, uh, but they're disappearing as sea level continues to rise. Okay, this word estuary, uh, there are a lot of definitions for it. This is one I particularly like. Uh, it defines it as a semi-enclosed basin which has a free connection to the ocean uh, and within which the ocean water mixes with fresh water that originates from the surrounding uplands. There are a lot of different types of estuaries around the world. Uh, in this stretch of the coast, two of them uh, were uh, established uh, in the last five or 10,000 years. Some are like North Inlet and Merles Inlet, uh, and these are systems that are high salinity, uh, that is, they're dominated by the uh, movement of tides in and out of the ocean inlet. They tend to have uh, large expanses of, of wetlands uh, and are surrounded by relatively small watersheds. And that's in contrast to the other type of estuary, Winya Bay being a classic example of that, with a number of rivers draining very large areas, in this case up to Virginia, uh, <coughs> Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, mixing close to the, to the sea. These systems tend to be more open water with relatively little uh, uh, wetland component. Uh, the focus today, of course, is on salt marshes, so we're going to talk about systems more like Merrill's Inlet. And these are usually described as dynamic and productive. Uh, they are indeed dynamic. Uh, they're systems which are constantly in motion as tides change the direction, the velocities, and the water level itself. Uh, on time scales of just minutes to hours, uh, the movement of water through networks of tidal creeks and across the intertidal zone enables the exchange of not only water but nutrients and all kinds of other materials uh, that are imported and exported. Uh, in addition, from watersheds, we have both surface water and groundwater inflow, and these affect biological processes, both in the marsh and in the waterways. The plant largely responsible for the very high primary productivity of these systems is known as Spartina alterniflora. Uh, it's a remarkable plant that has the capacity of synthesizing more organic material per acre than most uh, agricultural systems. In, a, in addition, uh, well, I should mention that, that very few animals eat green marsh grass, but a great many of them depend on the particles that result from its de decomposition. We often refer to this as detritus. Various kinds of algae are also important primary producers. The microalgae that create films on the mud, as well as the ones that are suspended in the water that we call phytoplankton, are all critical sources of food for, for a great many animals. So if we look at a cross section of a typical salt marsh and we start with the uh, blue area on the right, uh, we're looking at the level in the creeks at low tide. As the tide floods, of course, it comes up across the mud flats and oyster reefs, eventually over the marsh bank and extend across the, the vegetated intertidal. The elevation of, of the uh, ground uh, with respect to the tide uh, is uh, critical in terms of determining what kinds of plants grow there. Uh, and they change rather dramatically as we move toward the uplands. Uh, in fact, we tend to see tall growth Spartina near the edge, which grades down to quite a short form of that same species as we get to the upper extent of tidal inundation. And then beyond the regularly flooded area are plants that can only stand to be wet uh, maybe a few times a month, a whole different group of species. Uh, but they're all important in making the system work. Sea level <clears throat> continues to come up. Um, the instruments around the world are, are all showing this, but locally we can see it with our own eyes as our barrier islands are flooding more frequently than they used to and salt water is being pushed further up into the uplands, stressing trees and 
You've been creating ghost forest all up and down the coast. Sea levels uh, come up about five inches in the past 40 years, uh, and the rate has accelerated in the last decade. So what's this mean for salt marshes? Well, uh, Spartina lives in a fairly narrow range uh, within the tidal zone, and <clears throat> if, it is, uh, if it doesn't get enough flooding, it dries out. If it gets too much flooding, and the plants spend too much time underwater, um, they die as well. And in order to, um, to keep up with where they need to be in this optimal zone of growth, they have to accumulate uh, sediment. That is, they, they trap fine particles when they're flooded. Uh, the sediment surface comes up, the platform is raised, uh, and they need to do this at about the same rate the sea level's coming up. Research that's been done in North Inlet over the decades uh, with, with uh, very precise measurements uh, of the plant's production and sea level have shown that in general, uh, these marshes are not able to keep up with the rate of sea level rise we're experiencing today. The key to the future of salt marshes is their expansion, in this case <coughs> westward, into the uplands. And there's uh, indications all up and down the coast that they've been able to do that, albeit slowly, uh, and uh, with the exception of those areas, of course, that uh, are already armored with human infrastructure of various kinds. Jim Morris, who's been studying uh, the uh, North Inlet area, as well as lots of other estuaries on the East Coast and Gulf Coast, uh, predicts that within the next 50 years, uh, systems like Merrill's Inlet are no longer going to be expanses of marsh, but rather open water lagoons with just fringes of marsh around the edge. Estuaries are composed of a, uh, a great variety of habitats that are interconnected, of course, by the tide. Uh, in addition to the vegetated intertidal zone, we see these mud flats that are really critical. You can't see much life there, but there's a huge amount in the sediments, and they're important areas for larger animals to forage. Oyster reefs uh, are the homes uh, or feeding areas for more than 100 species of, of animals. And the creeks provide important uh, conduits for the movement of, of water into the uh, furthest reaches of the uh, marsh. And they also serve as the means by which our fishes, shrimps, and crabs can move into areas to forage, and that's where they feed mostly. There are about a thousand different kinds of animals out there, and the familiar ones, of course, are things like fiddler crabs and worms and hard clams and oysters, but uh, there are a lot of animals in the sediment that you never see, uh, including a a group called the myofauna, and these are microscopic animals uh, that occur in great numbers. In fact, if you took a tablespoon of pluff mud in the middle of the summer, uh, you'd have uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of little animals in there. Resident species, uh, of course, spend their entire life cycles within inlets, um, but there are others that only spend part of their time here, and, and that's uh, the transient animals. And, this includes most of the fishes, shrimps, and crabs of commercial and recreational importance. Most of the species occur as juvenile stages only, uh, spending months and sometimes years within the estuary before moving out to the ocean where they complete uh, the life cycle, uh, of course, becoming adults. Uh, because of this, we often refer to estuaries as um, nurseries. So one community I'm particularly fond of uh, are, are the zooplankton. Uh, this is uh, composed of, uh, of a great many different kinds of, of very small animals suspended in the water column. Uh, they're permanent members like the copepods, but a lot of them are there only temporarily, sometimes for hours or days, in a few cases for weeks. Uh, and these are the uh, results of the spawning of just about all of the 
invertebrates and fishes you can think of. Almost everybody gets their start as a member of the zooplankton. We've been studying this uh, group for a long time. In fact, we use very fine mesh nets to uh, collect every two weeks, and we've been doing this since 1981. And I'm not going to show you much data, but I did want to show you this and talk a little bit about the trends we're seeing. Uh, and that is the white line connects the average number during each of the 30, first 38 years of the study. And you can see we had a lot more zooplankton early on than we have these days. The statistical analyses suggest a decrease of about 40%. And that means we've lost you know, like 5,000 to 8,000 of these little animals per cubic meter of water. That's a whole lot. Uh, and it's happening over a great broad scale and it includes uh, you know, the decrease in all kinds of animals. But it's not only the zooplankton that have declined in numbers, uh, so the fishes and shrimps and crabs. And you know, these are the results of a uh, of surveys in the North Inlet area with the white lines uh, representing the numbers collected during the 1980s, the black bars in the uh, mid-2000s, and it's easy to see we've lost a lot of these larger animals as well. And the same goes for birds and insects uh, in other groups, not only locally, but throughout the world. Our environment is changing a whole lot, and um, separating and, and understanding the effects of the various uh, factors is, is a really big challenge for scientists. But it's probably more critical than ever that we make some progress there. Our research in North Inlet Estuary uh, is uh, providing a really rare, if not unique, opportunity to create a series of benchmarks that we can use to compare uh, with more developed uh, estuaries. And uh, it's because the water quality and the habitat quality in North Inlet are excellent, if not outstanding, that we're able to do this. Beside that, there's very little uh, impact from human activities. That means that the changes we've been seeing uh, can, uh, are probably not due to, to local influences, but to factors that are operating uh, externally on the scale of regions and, and, of course, the globe itself. One of those is water temperature, and we know that that's been going up almost everywhere, about three degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it used to be. Doesn't sound like much to you or I, but uh, for animals that can't control their own internal body temperatures, it's a lot, uh, especially during the winter. And these, uh, well, temperature is, you know, the fundamental driver of metabolism, of life processes like growth and respiration and reproduction and even behavior. The same amount of temperature change can affect different species in different ways. And in our studies, we've seen changes in migrations, in the times of spawning, in growth, and all of these are directly attributed to rather subtle changes in temperature. We think that this is having a, an effect on the uh, relationship between animals uh, and destabilizing the food web. And we think this is, is very much at the heart, that is these temperature-driven changes of uh, the uh, fewer animals that we've been seeing. So what about the health of our nation's estuaries? Uh, every five years, the Environmental Protection Agency does a uh, national condition assessment. I know this is too busy for you to, to digest, but um, <clears throat> on the left is uh, a summary of the results for eutrophication, which we can roughly think of as water quality. And <clears throat> with the exception of the tall blue bars in the lower corner for the western uh, coast estuaries, uh, most of the rest of the nation is considered only fair. And the Gulf and the Southeast are the lower ones and not improving. The other side is the biological condition and these are uh, based on the numbers and types and the sensitivity of animals that live in the mud. 
And we can see that generally, with the tall and blue bars, that uh, condition's pretty good. But again, uh, the southeast is lagging behind, and there's no indication uh, that it's getting any better. In closing, I, I wish I could um, you know, give you a, a more uplifting report, um, but there's no denying that estuaries are, are being stressed, both by changes in environmental conditions and by human activities. Um, estuaries are resilient, but their capacity to change without undergoing major transformations um, is probably limited. Although we're seeing a lot of changes, some major changes in these systems, we, um, and almost certainly there's a resetting of the stage to some degree, uh, we believe that you know, a lot of uh, the things we see, the salt marsh and animals, uh, are going to be here for generations to come. That said, some species are going to do better than others. Uh, and we think there are going to be a lot fewer of many of those species. Uh, we just have to hope that there are enough of our favorite animals around to keep, keep us smiling. Thanks for your interest. Thanks, John. Well, that's some sobering news. On the other hand, a very nice lady asked me uh, before we got started um, whether you could go sailing in the inlet. Well, the good news is in 50 years, yes. <laughs> um, at this time, we're going to learn a little more about the state of Merle's Inlet today. And to give us that is Dr. Eric Smith, who is the manager of the North Inlet Winya, North Inlet Winya Bay National Estuary Research Reserve. Dr. Smith is the Associate Research Professor at the University of South Carolina's Bell W. Baruch Institute for Marine and Coastal Sciences, uh, the manager of the Research Reserve, and uh, Dr. Smith earned his BA in Biology at New York University in 1987, his Master's in Marine Science from the University of Maryland in 1994, and his Doctorate in Marine Science also from the University of Maryland in the year 2000. His interests in research include the ecology and biochemistry of salt marshes and estuaries, as well as the functions and effects of stormwater retention ponds and other facets of water, interplay between watersheds and coastal nearshore waters, sediments, and life. Dr. Eric Smith. Thank you, Chip. Can you hear me in the back okay? All right. Uh, okay, well, Chip, thank you very much for inviting me. It's really um, great to see so many people show up for this. I, am, I was charged with too big a task to talk to you in, in its entirety about the state of the estuary. I'm going to focus on a brief review of a couple of aspects, particularly water and habitat quality. Um, one, because that's for Merle's Inlet, what we know more about than the higher fauna. And two, I think we can actually do some things about that. To do that, um, I'm gonna ask us to turn our perspective a little bit and look inland, because I really wanna make the case that when we think about water and habitat quality of an estuary, we really need to understand that that is largely a reflection of the conditions in its uplands, in its watershed. Um, particularly with respect to coastal development, that has two important facets for the discussion today. It profoundly changes the water balance, the amount of water running into the estuary, and the concentrations of material that are transported by that water from the uplands, from the watershed, into our estuaries our tidal creeks and our open waters. This is a simple schematic that um, I use in all sorts of talks. It's produced by the EPA, and it really nicely summarizes sort of the fate of precipitation, the fate of rainfall falling on a forested natural landscape all the way up to a heavily urbanized landscape. 
And as we pave paradise, as we cut down the trees, as we um, create parking lots and rooftops and other impervious surfaces, um, the trees are very good at taking water from the ground and putting it back up into the air. That's what we call evapotranspiration. The trees transpire water up into the atmosphere as, as well as evaporation of surfaces. The lack of pavement allows water to seep into the ground, infiltrate into the ground, replenishing groundwater. So there's very little left to run off as stormwater runoff. As we increase the amount of impervious surfaces and we lose the trees that transpire, we get less evapotranspiration, less infiltration, and a great deal more surface runoff. And so for a lot of the studies that look at the impacts of watersheds on water quality and the health of the estuaries, we focus on the degree of development, particularly the degree of impervious surfaces. So this is the watershed of Merle's Inlet, where the, the reds and pinks are various intensities of development on large scale. The greens are forest and natural areas, and then of course we have marsh and open water. And we can see going south to north, um, thanks to Huntington Beach and Brook Green Garden, we have a lot of green and natural areas in the south and a great deal of predominantly low and medium intensity development as we get up into Surfside, Merle's Inlet uh, proper, Garden City, etc. There's been a number of studies comparing Merle's Inlet and North Inlet in terms of the impacts of development and watershed. Um, this is a really nice one by Wall and co-authors. Co uh, Wall and McKellar were at USC. Um, just as an aside, Tom Williams was at Clemson. So when it comes to understanding the impacts of development, we pay no attention to football and rivalry on the sports team. We're all in it together for the environment. Uh, these gentlemen um, compared two creeks, one in the developed area of Merle's Inlet and one in the largely forested area of North Inlet's watershed and looked at the cumulative discharge from these creeks as rainfall over the course of a year. This is the North Inlet, so as it rains, there's um, increasing discharge out of that creek into the inlet over the course of the year. You can see most of that increase in runoff happens during the winter months from um, February to about this time of year. What happens in that period? Uh, the trees um, are dormant. There's not a lot of transpiration. The water tables are high. So there's a lot of water to run off. In contrast, the gray line um, is Merle's Inlet, and you can see a steady, as the rain falls, just more and more water accumulates as runoff throughout the year. So by the end, the amount of water this one creek in Merle's Inlet um, discharges, this one creek in this area discharges to Merle's Inlet is almost twice, about 70% greater than the corresponding creek in uh, North Inlet. And I should have said these are were chosen, they're equally sized, they got about the same rainfall, so this really is a function of that development. Uh, this study also measured what's in the water that's running off from these two creeks. With a focus on nutrients, this is, um, you know, everybody who's tried to grow a green lawn, planted a garden, knows the importance of nutrients for fueling um, plant growth. Too much of a good thing causes the eutrophication that Dennis talked about earlier. So there's been a lot of work understanding nutrients. Uh, keeping with the color scheme, the gray bars are Merle's Inlet, the green bars are North Inlet, winter and summer. And you can see for the nitrate nitrite version of nitrogen, as well as phosphorus, uh, there's much higher concentrations in the Merle's Inlet runoff compared to um, North Inlet. Interestingly, not so from ammonia. Uh, forests tend to export a lot of um, recycled nitrogen and that shows up in ammonia. But when we talk about export from the watershed, we need to talk about concentrations and the amount of water that's carrying them. So concentration times the amount of water quantity is load. And that'll become important later. 
once you factor in how much water is coming out of those systems and multiply that by the concentrations, now we see much greater differences in the total flux, the total annual load of nitrogen as nitrate and even as ammonia, right? So big changes in water can compensate for big changes in concentration. So if you're going to reduce loads, you get much bigger bang for your buck if you can reduce the amount of water coming off of those developed surfaces um, than trying to mess with the concentrations. In a perfect world, of course, you would do both. This general pattern is, as Dennis alluded to earlier, a, a common understanding. Um, Although I just showed you the comparison between Merle's Inlet and North Inlet, a group of researchers from DNR and NOAA have synthesized data collected along the entire coast and shown that that's a general pattern. Broadly speaking, sort of the quality of the estuary reflects the degree of urbanization at the large scale. And I'll show you just a little bit of data to illustrate this. So fecal coliform, perhaps folks are already familiar with the um, bacterial pollution problems that are closing shellfish beds. In watersheds with relatively low percent impervious cover, relatively low development, most of the samples are below the state standards for fecal contamination. By the time you get up to watersheds that have over 50% impervious surface or degree of urban suburban land cover, the percentage of samples that are below the standards goes down, and the percent that are above or even well above goes quite a bit up. That same pattern holds for all sorts of things. Um, the ERMQ is an index of sort of sediment contamination. This is the amount of pHs, um, pesticides, heavy metals, etc., in the sediments. And you can see that as development increases, we get a lot more samples, sediment samples, that are scoring in the um, fair and poor quality. The authors of this work for DNR. The data sets that they were using are continue to be compiled today and, in fact, are used for the state's one um, biannual report card for coastal waters. Um, this is available on DNR's website. Um, through the EPA, you can actually get to the raw data itself. And every two years, um, DNR, working with EPA and NOAA, produces something called the South Carolina, oh, I didn't, um, South Carolina Estuarine and Coastal Assessment Program. This is a copy of their latest report. What the CCAP assessment is, is a probabilistic sampling of the entire coast. So every summer they go out and they randomly sample 100 samples total along the coast. It's a probabilistic based sampling because they decide where to sample in proportion to the amount of habitat to the types of water that are there and then randomly distribute that within those individual water bodies. So I don't I think you can see this in the back, but this is the sample from 1718. Merle's Inlet got one sample taken, as did um, North Inlet. Winyan Bay, being slightly larger, got two samples. So it's not data rich, right? It has to encompass the entire coast, and they only have the cash to do 100 samples a year because the analyses are very expensive. It's also a, a um, scored based on a composite set of indices taking into account water quality, sediment quality, and biological condition. And there's a variety of parameters that factor into all of those. And then those individual scores feed up to the overall assessment. For some of those scores, there are state numeric criteria. There are hard numbers for what is good, what is bad. For most of them, there aren't. So the other thing we need to keep in mind, water bodies are graded on a curve. This is largely determined by where sites fall relative to the, the numbers 
for all the other sites along the coast. So if the entire coast is doing bad, well, some sites might be better than others, but they're still bad, right? It's a graded on a curve. Nonetheless, Merle's Inlet, so now I'm showing you color-coded for all the data. So there's about 12 times in the last decade that Merle's Inlet got sampled. And as an overall habitat quality score, scores in the good category, right? There's only three options, poor, fair, and good. As does North Inlet, in contrast to many of the systems in the south and, and Winyan Bay, being the drainage, being the receiver of um, a much larger industrial and agricultural drainage, tends to receive a lot more fair and poor scores. So, relatively speaking, all is not lost in terms of our overall habitat quality. We're not doing too bad. Of course, there's a lot of caveats to this. Um, as I mentioned, there's not a lot of data that goes into this. And it's randomly sampled, but mostly it's in the larger creeks and open waters. It doesn't go out and intentionally sample sites. If you go out and intentionally sample sites, you can find areas adjacent to marinas, areas adjacent to outfalls. You can game the system. The, the approach here is trying to be as unbiased as possible. And I already talked about how it's graded on a curve. So an overall good habitat quality score can mask weaknesses in certain composite scores. And we all know, or we probably all know, or I'm about to tell you if for some reason you don't know, Merle's Inlet clearly has some significant water quality problems, at least in portions of the estuary. Some of the shellfish beds have been closed for quite some time. That's depicted in the orange. This is the uh, latest map provided by DHEC of where you can harvest shellfish and where you can't. So for much of the open water portion of the bay, have at it, it's fine. But for a good bit of the north, the south, and right along the inner coast, um, those areas are closed. And those areas are closed entirely due to the potential for microbial pollution as indexed by fecal coliform or fecal bacteria. This is not news. This really should not be news to many people. Way back in 2005, the state created a total maximum daily load, TMDL, recognizing that many of the creeks in those areas of the map that I just showed you were exceeding water quality thresholds for microbial contamination, fecal bacteria pollution. If you're not familiar with the TMDL, it is what the EPA, what the feds require the state to do to enable, well, required when water bodies are recognized as exceeding standards, contravening established standards. It's a process that allows loading of pollutants to be quantified such that the state can then start um, remediating those, creating water quality based controls to restore the health of the system. The key findings of the Merle's Inlet TMDL are it's a non point source problem. We have no wastewater discharges. We have um, no point sources of microbial loot loading. In addition to this, um, source tracking efforts done in conjunction with this TMDL and since then have shown that the fecal bacteria we're talking about is not human. Leaking septic, leaking wastewater, um, sewage transport is relatively rare. I'm not going to say it never happens, but the overall findings of the source tracking efforts are its pets and its wildlife, by and large. 
according to the models, to get back to maintaining water quality standards would take a load reduction of some 70, 80 percent. The concern that many folks have is that TMDL was established in 2005. That was supposed to create the pathway forward to improving water quality. Showing you a little bit of data from a select number of sites in these closed areas from DHEC, these are the concentrations um, on an annual basis. We don't really have to get into the details of what the 90th percentile means. Um, but it's a way to compare those data with this green line, which is that water quality standard for go out and harvest um, oysters. And most of those sites are well above that green line and don't really show, with maybe the exception of one or two sites, any kind of decline. In fact, some of those sites that have been down sort of hovering just around, just above the state standards are perhaps starting to show some increases in the latter years. It's a bit soon to hang your hat on that trend, but it is certainly um, troubling. Just like the sampling sites within the shellfish beds, within the basin, are variable, so too are sources of loading to that basin. So now I'm showing you Thanks to the great efforts of some folks uh, in this audience right now, the uh, Merle's Inlet Volunteer Monitoring Program in conjunction with Coastal Carolina's Waccamaw Watershed Academy has gone out over the past 10 years or so and sampled concentrations of fecal bacteria at a variety of um, drainages right as they come into Merle's Inlet. And I'm just showing you um, the distribution if you're not familiar with box and whiskers plots, the colored portion is sort of the central 50% of the data. There are literally thousands of data points in all of these um, bar graphs. Half of them fall within the box, 90% of them fall within the lines. And you can see even within the, the number that are up in the, in the high density, sorry, I should really say um, low to mid density, uh, development areas, there's a great deal of variability. In fact, we can compare that directly to the proportions of forest to development in those subwatersheds because all of those subwatersheds have been delineated. And despite similarities in degree of development, some of these sites show rather low water quality, um, low fecal concentrations um, meeting water quality standards. Whereas um, right next to it, or going this way, despite high areas of forested and wetland, um, we still see very high concentrations. So, I have no idea where I am on time. You got about two minutes. Oh, that's <laughs> shocking. Um, so I'd like to wrap up with a couple of points. There are reasons to despair in terms of the global picture for the fate of estuaries. I would add a caveat to Jim's prediction, and that is that's given projected sea level rise. We get off, here's my little soapbox. We get off the the uh, CO2 habit, those seas won't rise as fast, those estuaries won't drown as quickly. It's not even um, too late to despair too much about Merle's Inlet's water quality and habitat quality. It's fairly good. I acknowledge the caveats. I remind you of the caveats um, because that's not to say everything is rosy. There are definite problem locations. There are definite uh, problem Pollutants, I emphasized fecals. I did not have time to talk about a number of emerging contaminants of concern. Those who have gone out looking will find areas that are <clears throat> of sediments that are very high in polyaromatic hydrocarbons. These are the combustion, fossil fuel combustion byproducts that can be very toxic to all those um, worms that grow in the sediments that Dennis talked about. 
heavy metals, persistent organic pollutants, etc. I would say let's not take our eye off the goal of solving the fecal bacteria TMDL problem because that's all about addressing the terrestrial loads and I would argue if you address the terrestrial loads you will by default take care of a bunch of these problems as well because the source of all of these is the watershed as well. Doing that means really understanding both quality and quantity. That is also nothing new. Merle's Inlet 2020 with um, the Council of Governments 10 years ago produced a very nice uh, watershed report. It's available on the Merle's Inlet 2020 website if you, if you haven't checked it out. Um, and it talks very much about understanding and mitigating flows. And I think there's a lot of potential there. And then better understanding the causes of that variability across those subwatersheds. It's not all about development, right? The, the volunteer monitoring program shows that my initial general blanket statement about all development is bad is categorically not true. There are subtleties around there, and it's most likely on how the stormwater is dealt with in that development. So I will stop there, and thanks very much for your time and attention. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Smith. You should I swim in Merle's in it? Um, the recreational contact standards exist. There are parts that are in those closed shellfish beds that I would not swim in after a heavy rain. Um, but in that open water portion, by all means, I would swim. I personally would swim in the open water portions. And do stick around, Dr. Smith. I have a feeling there'll be some questions for you at the end. And uh, if we have uh, water quality monitors in the audience, if you would stand up, we'll recognize you. That's the terrific work you're doing. Thank you so much. And the third part of our presentation today is called Peril and Promise, What You Can Do. This features Katie Finnegan and Maeve Snyder. Katie, to my immediate left, is the Coastal Processes Program Specialist with South Carolina Sea Grant. She was born in Asheville, North Carolina, but grew up spending her summers with her grandparents in Beaufort, North Carolina, where she discovered her love of beaches and the smell of marsh mud. She earned her bachelor's and her master's degree in environmental engineering from NC State and recently transitioned from doing consulting engineering to working with the South Carolina Sea Grant at Coastal Carolina, where she helps with research and education in areas such as beach erosion, living shorelines, and sea level rise. Maeve Snyder is the Coastal Training Program Coordinator at the, here it comes, North Inlet Winyaw Bay National Estuarine <laughs> Research Reserve. In this role, she supports science-based decision-making through tools, skills, information, and partnerships. Maeve earned her master's in biological sciences from the University of South Carolina and a bachelor of science in biology from Coastal Carolina University. Maeve has experience in ecological research, including a thesis focused on climate-driven range shifts of marine organisms. She has worked in science communication and education throughout the coastal southeast. And I would like to give both of y'all a microphone, but that one went dead, so if you could okay. share. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we have the uplifting part of the, the seminar here to tell you more about what you can do. I just want to start by giving a brief overview of South Carolina Sea Grant in case you're not familiar. The National Sea Grant Program was established by Congress in 1966 and basically it's just working to create and maintain a healthy coastal environment and economy. Um, the Sea Grant Network, which you see a map of here, consists of federal and university partnerships between NOAA and 34 university-based programs. Um, you'll find these in the coastal states, the Great Lakes, and our territories as well. Um, and the Sea Grant model is to support and facilitate research 
by doing, um, well, research extension and then outreach and education of our science-based information um, in a variety of coastal focus areas. So for South Carolina Sea Grant, we're organized as a consortium. We were officially established in 1980, and I've listed the mission there, which I'll let you read. Um, and we have nine member institutions. A lot of our universities, probably they'll look familiar to you. We also have DNR as a member institution. Um, for my position, I am jointly funded out of Coastal Carolina University, so that's where I physically sit. So I'm you know, here to help extend the, the reach of Sea Grant into our North Coast um, Grand Strand area. Um, hi everyone, thanks for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, Dennis and Eric did a good job of introducing the North Inlet Winyabe National Estuary Research Reserve, which you can refer to by its acronym, the NEAR, or the Reserve. Um, but I just wanted to introduce the entire system that we work for. There are actually 30 of these NEARs uh, across the country, um, and we're very lucky to have two here in South Carolina. The Ace Basin near is our other uh, our other reserve. And NEARs are protected for research and monitoring, education and training, and stewardship. Um, and I just want to highlight that Katie and I are going to tag team this presentation because we're just two of many different agencies and organizations that are working on coastal management issues across the coast. So marsh management is an increasingly um, relevant topic that people are talking about across the coast of South Carolina. Marshes are under a lot of different pressures, everything from sea level rise to uh, water quality impairments that we've heard about, um, over harvesting of natural resources, and many others. But we are very fortunate as a state South Carolina has about 350,000 acres of salt marsh. That's among the largest extent of salt marsh um, of all of the states on the East Coast. And salt marshes are really valuable <coughs> ecosystems. Um, we've heard a lot about the different benefits that they provide to communities. But in order to maintain those services, there's increased awareness that we might need to start proactively managing for the maintenance of all the good things that marshes provide for us. And I think marsh management has sort of been a back burner topic relative to other things like beachfront management. Beaches are incredibly dynamic ecosystems, they change all the time, and so there's maybe been some more proactive thought about that. They also have a lot of hazards and risks associated with storms and flooding and erosion. But marshes also present a number of hazards and risks to marsh front communities alongside all the valuable services they provide. And so they do sort of merit their own proactive planning. So I want to point out that there are quite a few organizations that uh, think about these topics and are, are working on them currently. One you may have heard of before is called the South Atlantic I have to remember, the South Atlantic Salt Marsh Initiative, or SASME. Um, that's just one of many groups that are taking on this issue of marsh management. And I want to point out, um, so here's a picture looking out over Garden City, to Myrtle's Inlet. Um, this actually sort of shows what I think is the most common uh, environment in which marsh management planning has been considered in South Carolina which is the barrier island community that has a beachfront oceanward and then on the back side of the island that marsh. Merle's Inlet is sort of a unique case because it's actually a basin. And I'm going to share some examples as we go through looking at communities that have started this proactive approach to marsh front management. Within South Carolina, these examples are usually barrier island communities such as the city of Holly Beach or the town of Kiowa Island. Um, so definitely some similarities, especially just geographically, but I want to point out that they, we do have some unique challenges here in Merle's Inlet because 
there's not um, a single jurisdiction. It actually spans Ori and Georgetown counties. There's not, you know, a city or town of Merle's Inlet. And that has really been the locus for the examples that I'm going to share. It's been done through these municipalities. And then I want to share some uh, examples from research that we recently did um, through our two South Carolina reserves, really trying to get a better handle on stakeholders of marsh management issues. This research really was driven to identify research priorities for reserve researchers going forward. Um, really focused on that applied research. What questions do communities have that need answers? If that information is already out there, can we connect them to it? Or can we identify new research questions that will give the communities the information they need to make informed, science-based decisions? And really what I want you to take away from this is that there are many different services and values that people um, connect to marshes. And those are different across different affiliations, different groups of people, their backgrounds. Um, this is a survey that we did of marsh management stakeholders across the South Carolina coast. We talked to folks in regulatory roles marsh management roles, so that might be natural, natural resource professionals or municipal officials, planning staff, um, marsh researchers, and then education outreach folks. So this is just a snapshot of one point in time, and it's a group of people from across the entire coast. But we wanted to just, I just wanted to show that there are so many different values that people have for the marshes. Um, among the highest priorities that people identified were flooding protection. So those protective services that marshes give us, they buffer against storms, they tend to wave energy, they store water, um, wildlife habitat, both for, um, you know, like bird watching, and, uh, but, rec but also recreational fishing, commercial fishing, those important species. But marshes also promote cultural significance, um, economic contributions through commercial fisheries, tourism, et cetera, and recreational value, all the aesthetic and um, you know, outdoor activities that people value. And this is really just a very short excerpt of this larger survey that we did, trying to understand where folks are at across the coast. Um, but another question that we asked was about marsh resilience, and we alluded to like how marshes over the coming 50 or so years could um, become open water due to sea level rise. And we wanted to know if people are starting to plan for marsh resilience, what does resilience mean to them? And how long are they thinking in terms of resilience? Like what time scales are they looking at? Most people are thinking 20 to 50 years, but some people are thinking more short term. Some people are really focused on marsh resilience and perpetuity. But I think it's a good question for communities to ask, and I just wanted to share this example of what communities can focus on. So coming out of this survey and trying to understand the needs, the priorities of marsh stakeholders across the coast, we did come away thinking, we've got some information that we should share already. People are asking questions that we have the answers to, and it's just about connecting those people to that information. And so we've put together a number of different education opportunities. Um, these have included decision maker trainings, where we get those different types of stakeholders, regulatory, management, research, education, talking to each other, um, and they can um, share that knowledge. So we've done a webinar on marsh front management planning, and this is available online, and I've put together a list of handouts, um, or a list of links that will be shared as a handout afterwards. Actually, later this week, we'll have a training where we're going to take people out in the marsh at Haw Paw Barony, out in North Inlet, and talk about understanding the marsh change. These are naturally dynamic systems, and we're going to learn about all the ways that 
scientists are monitoring and measuring that and how marshes naturally change over time and how they're likely to change in response to human impacts like sea level rise. And I wanted to share that um, there are a ton of resources available to learn more. I think as all of you as engaged members of the community, can one thing you can do is to just educate yourself better, to communicate that to your leaders and decision makers, and also to make, make more informed decisions on your own. Um, we put together a website that's hosted on the Ace Basin Reserves website where we collected a research bibliography, so sort of a current state of knowledge of um, marsh science. There's a link, a list of links of marsh resources, all the different websites. Um, I'll share a few of these later on. But just anyone, any organization or agency that's working on marsh health. And we also have upcoming events, all the trainings that um, we have sort of developed as a result of these efforts. One I really wanted to highlight is that Clemson has developed a website on living shorelines. Living shorelines, we haven't talked about much. It's a, a best management practice for um, preventing erosion, allowing marshes to migrate naturally, stabilizing shorelines, and it's actually something where research and regulatory officials were able to work together to improve the permitting process to make these sorts of projects easier to do. Um, and there's also a salt marsh short course that's a really good like primer on marsh ecology. And that's it for me. Like I said, I'm going to share all those resources, but I'm going to let Katie take over. Okay, so I just want to take a moment and highlight a project that I'm working on with South Carolina Sea Grant, and then I'll dig a little bit more into some of the individual actions that you all can be taking. Um, so recently this year we received a grant um, of about half a million dollars with our partners at DNR, the College of Charleston, and Louisiana State University to conduct a four-year study. Um, we're going to look at the benefits and feasibility of a marsh management technique that's called thin layer placement. And thin layer placement is exactly what it sounds like. So in the dredging process, instead of taking sediment offshore or putting it on a beach or in an upland area, the idea is you spray it over a marsh, an existing marsh, um, and it'll land in a thin layer. So Dr. Allen talked in the beginning about how sediment, sorry, marshes need to trap sediment to keep up with sea level rise. So what this technique is doing is helping them keep up with sea level rise artificially by introducing the sediment into the system so they're not drowned out. Um, this technique is fairly new. Um, it's not yet widely practiced. There's been a, um, it hasn't occurred in South Carolina. There's been a pilot project in Georgia and then a couple of small experiments done in North Carolina, more for research papers. Um, but what we're hoping to do with our study is kind of look at this technique what are the unknowns? What are the questions? What do we need to be thinking about if we are going to implement this in South Carolina? Looking at the economics behind it, the ecology, the regulatory considerations, um, the social cultural, again, Maeve saying that marshes have this value. Um, we also plan to model um, this technique to see how effective it can be. Um, but we'll be conducting the study for the entire South Carolina coast, evaluating the marshes and you know, where it makes the most sense for this technique to be employed in the future. We are working very closely with the Army Corps of Engineers Charleston District. They are very interested and motivated in, in conducting a thin layer placement project. So we hope that with our study and working with them, we can kind of help them figure out where that will make sense. Okay, so now to focus on you all. Um, there are definitely countless ways that you can get involved. Um, I've just listed a variety of local um, organizations I'll kind of talk about briefly, but if you, just as you're listening, think about your own skills and interests, you're not going to be able to get involved with everyone and everything. Um, so think about, you know, what piques your interest and then look more into that. Because um, all of these partners here have websites, they have newsletters, they have event calendars, um, so it might be something you're interested in signing up for. Um, and then you can invite your friends and your neighbors to join you as well. 
If you want to look into marsh grass planting, um, either in the greenhouse or in the field with the Spartina, you can look at the Department of Natural Resources or even within Sea Grant for those kinds of opportunities. If you're interested in artificial reef building, um, that's another opportunity with the Department of Natural Resources that you can do some hands-on um, uh, building of that. If you want to learn more about invasive plant species and how to remove those, the Native Plant Society recently has of this year a Grand Strand chapter that you can be involved with. Um, Maeve has mentioned countless webinars and trainings that she does both in person, um, in the field as well. Um, Clemson has several as well with their extension program. You can find those if you're just wanting, wanting to learn more, whether in the field or online. Um, I know litter pickups were talked about in the beginning and a variety of organizations do those as well. So that's always something you can be involved in. If you want to do more of the advocacy approach and looking at policy, the Coastal Conservation League is a great organization to plug into. Um, maybe you're interested in rain gardens. Um, Clemson has a training on that and they're doing several community installs where you can participate and learn techniques and also implement those in your own backyard. Um, even more, a lot of this is probably going to be familiar, but I don't think it ever hurts us to hear it again. Um, you know, we want to reduce, reuse, and recycle, eliminate the, eliminate the amount of trash that we're putting into our environment in the first place, bringing our reusable bags to the grocery store, our reusable water bottles with us where we go. Maybe you can start composting your food scraps in your own kitchens and backyards. Um, making sure to donate things whenever possible instead of throwing them away that we don't need. Um, if we want to look at reducing our polluted runoff, you might be in the position where you can install rain barrels um, and collect that water. Um, if you have the ability again to reduce paved surfaces in your own, um, your own homes, make sure we're keeping sidewalks and lawns, driveways clear of that pet waste which we were hearing about earlier. Um, trash, toxic chemicals, motor oil, all that stuff just runs off into our wetlands and causes pollution, so keeping our areas clean. Um, again, the native plants, I highlighted the Native Plant Society earlier, but it's really important that we have plants and that they are native, so if you're looking for appropriate plants um, to add to green up your environment, um, the Native Plant Society would be a good place to start. We want to make sure we're protecting our wetland habitat, not filling in wetlands, developing them. Um, Maeve briefly mentioned the living shoreline, so if you have a waterfront part of your property and it's eroding, not wanting to put up um, concrete structures or wooden structures, looking more at helping have plants installed to stabilize the soil and keep it in place. Um, using non-toxic products whenever we can, um, especially when we're thinking about our lawn and garden fertilizers. Um, those non-nitrogen lawn supplements. We want to avoid excess nutrient pollution. Um, we don't want to be promoting algae growth. Um, we don't want to create dead zones that are toxic to species. Um, making sure that we, we do use fertilizer. Um, it's not a windy day or a rainy day, so that is immediately being washed off or taken somewhere that it doesn't need to go. And I think most importantly, just respecting our natural areas. Um, I think we all live here for a reason. We all love to be here for a reason. Um, just obeying rules anytime we're at a park, but also just taking the time to go to the parks. Um, Huntington Beach State Park and Brook Green have both been mentioned. We have Myrtle Beach State Park. We have the Waccamaw National Wildlife Refuge. We have Lewis Ocean Bay Heritage Preserve. We have so much around us in our two counties to enjoy. Um, and I think it's just so important to take the time to get out there and appreciate them and you, again it's all about bringing your friends and neighbors and families and helping everyone realize the importance of, of where we live. That's all. That's all we have. Perfect. Thank you Katie and Maeve.